Okay, uh, so last time we uh, finished talking about, uh, I believe, types of reactions in chapter seven, I believe. And so we're off to uh, chapter nine here, uh, where we're going to talk about uh, really sort of putting together a couple of things uh, from kind of chapter seven, chapter eight. Uh, so grams and moles and equations. Uh, we're going to talk about stoichiometry in this chapter uh, and what stoichiometry really is, is sort of a conversion factor that is achieved from uh, the balanced chemical equation. And we can use the equation to figure out things like if we start with so much reactants, how much products we should produce. Uh, if we also know, for example, how much products we produce, we can sort of back calculate and figure out how much reactants that we started with. So the stoichiometry oftentimes will answer those types of questions. And sometimes people get a little bit confused with stoichiometry and maybe overcomplicates it. And as we'll talk about here, uh, really what stoichiometry is, is really nothing more than just a conversion factor. And as we'll talk about, instead of sort of going to a table and sort of finding the conversion factor, the place where we do get the conversion factor from is actually the balance equation. So we kind of use the balance equation as a conversion factor. The reason we typically have to do that in stoichiometry problems, as we'll talk about, is uh, usually you're given some piece of information about somebody in the reaction that you're really not interested in. You're actually interested in somebody else that's in the reaction. So you need a way to go from what they gave you, sort of that information about whoever they gave you, to the information about what you are interested in. So when we use a balance equation, which is really probably the most important thing when you do a stoichiometry sort of calculation is the equation 100% always needs to be balanced. So uh, if you are starting with an unbalanced equation or a wrongly balanced equation, you pretty much just screwed up all the rest of your calculations. So it really is really important, especially doing stoichiometry problems to make sure that you do have a balanced equation. When we look at a balanced equation, there's a few things that we talked about uh, that we could use the coefficients for. She used the right pen there, I'm sure that one. Uh, when we look at these coefficients, we could say, for example, that two molecules of H2 react with one molecule of O2 uh, to yield or produce two molecules of H2O. Really with stoichiometry, the relationship that we really use the most, it's actually the one in the middle, and is what's sometimes referred to as the mole-to-mole -mole relationship. So kind of this relationship here is definitely the one that we use the most uh, when we do stoichiometry problems. And it works really the same way. Again, these numbers are really just coming from, thank you, are really just coming from the coefficients. So we could say, looking at those coefficients, that two moles of H2 react with one mole of O2 uh, to form two moles of H2O. The last sort of relationship is one we really don't use all that much in stoichiometry or anything like that, but it illustrates the point of a balanced equation. So because in a chemical reaction, the only thing that changes are the bonds and electrons, we never change protons. So we always have, as we talked about when we're doing balancing equations, the conservation of each element. Uh, so for example, if I have four hydrogens on the left, uh, I should have uh, you know, four times one, basically four grams of hydrogen on the left, and I should end up with four grams of hydrogen on the right-hand side as well. And that's sort of where the 36 and 36 grams sort of come from, uh, because we have the same number of each element on each side. They each have the same molar mass on each side, and that's that conservation of mass. <clears throat> So stoichiometry, as I mentioned, is a really important calculation in chemistry, and it allows us, as I mentioned, to really figure out relationships of everybody in any chemical reaction based solely on the equation. And pretty much you just need a minimum of one piece of information. So kind of one piece of information about maybe a reactant. Uh, maybe how much reactant you're starting with, or one piece of information about a product, how much product you produce. And like I said, you can figure out, you know, how much product you should produce if you started with a certain amount. You could also figure out how much of our reactants we started with, if we know how much product we produce. By the way, stoichiometry can be related to everybody in the equation. So we'll talk about it here, but sometimes people, when they think about stoichiometry, 
and we sort of think about the equation and the arrow, they think that the relationships always has to be sort of on opposite sides of the arrow. And, and they can be. So you can relate a reactant to a product using stoichiometry. You can relate a product to a reactant using stoichiometry. But you can also relate things on the same side of the arrow. So you can relate reactant to reactant using stoichiometry. You could also relate a product to another product if you had two products, for example. So you could use stoichiometry really for anybody in that equation. Uh, you don't necessarily have to relate it from like one guy to the other side of the arrow and kind of back and forth. Uh, you could stay on one side of the arrow or the other side of the arrow in terms of those relationships. Now, when we do stoichiometry problems, the units that we start with really could be a lot of different units. Um, for the most part in this chapter here, we're going to deal with a lot of grams and moles. So we've talked about grams and moles and how to go back and forth. And when you do stoichiometry problems, that is a really important sort of relationship going from grams to moles or even backwards, moles to grams. Once again, it is the molar mass, right? From the periodic table and grams per mole that allows us to do that conversion. And that is a sort of conversion that we use a lot in stoichiometry problems. A lot of times we'll use the molar mass at the beginning of the stoichiometry problem to go from grams to moles. And at the end of it, we'll go from moles back to grams, again, using molar mass. So that sort of calculation that I think we did in chapter eight, I think it was, um, we definitely use a lot. We will also see as we go through some of the remaining chapters, I say remaining like we're at the end. I feel like we're there almost. Uh, uh, the remaining chapters that we have, we will also see stoichiometry come back into play when we talk about things like gases. There's gas stoichiometry, which may be used units of uh, liters. Uh, also, solution also has stoichiometry involved where we use things like molarity and volume and stuff like that. So you can do stoichiometry problems with all kinds of units. Probably mainly focus here in Chapter 9 is going to be really the grams and moles sort of aspect of it. But we'll see it again as we talk about gases and solutions a little later on. So the method behind this is what is sometimes referred to as the mole method. And basically, it's a group of equalities that you could get that lead to conversion factors that come from the balanced equation. So like I said, instead of sort of looking up in a table that, you know, one inch is 2.54 centimeters, we go to the equation to find our sort of conversion factor. And basic stoichiometry problems, they really do boil down to kind of four basic steps that we'll talk about. This has a couple, one extra step in it. Now, occasionally, I won't say very often, but occasionally you may be given a problem where uh, you have everything in words. So you need to turn those words, obviously, into the proper chemical formulas. And that's sort of what step one is. Uh, so remember that when you turn sort of words into formulas and you also need to balance the equation, which is really the most important part here, you want to do those things separately, right? So you want to make sure you get all the correct formulas down first, and then you go back and balance it with the coefficients, and you want to do it in that order. I will say probably nine times out of 10, or maybe even a little bit more if that's possible, uh, you probably will actually start with an equation that's already given to you in formulas. But just in case you're not, you want to make sure you get everybody in the right formulas. Regardless of how the equation is given to you or not, when you see that equation, you definitely want to make sure it is balanced. So as I mentioned before, if it is not balanced, you're pretty much wasting your time with the rest of the calculation because everything's going to be incorrect. So I would say if you have an equation given to you and you see numbers, probably it's balanced unless they're trying to trick you. Uh, if you are given an equation and there's like no coefficients, you definitely should take a hard look at it and make sure that it's balanced. And even with coefficients, you should take a look at it. But I would say in most cases, it's probably going to be balanced. Once you have the balanced equation, the next really important thing after that is they will give you a piece of information. So they'll give you some type of piece of information about a reactant, about a product. And basically what you want to do is whatever units they give it to you in, they most likely will be in grams, but whatever units they happen to give it to you in, you need to convert them to moles. So those are like your no thinking, I'm doing a stoichiometry problem, balance the equation, convert to moles. Those are like always the first two steps, no matter what type of problem you're kind of doing. And that is sort of what you always want to do. 
really the reason we need to convert it to moles is because the stoichiometry part of the calculation is a mole to mole relationship. That way all the units will cancel out correctly. And the stoichiometry part, which is the next part is you go to the balance equation, and two things you're interested in. One thing that you would be interested in is whatever they gave you in terms of a number and whatever that is. The other thing that you're probably interested in is what you're trying to find. The other thing in the equation that you're trying to find. You'd go to the balance equation. You'd be able to find the mole to mole relationship, which is frankly just the coefficients from the balance equation. So whatever the numbers are, will give you that mole to mole relationship. And that will allow you to go from what they gave you to what you're actually interested in. And basically that's the conversion factor and that's the big stoichiometry part of it. After you're done with the stoichiometry step, you should always be in moles, unless you did something really wrong, you should always be in moles. And if the question wanted moles, you put a box on it, you're done. But a lot of times they really don't want moles, but a lot of times they will want some other unit at the end like grams. So on the back end of the calculation, a lot of times you're going from moles back to grams and using something like the molar math. It may not be grams that they're interested in. Maybe they're interested in some other unit. Maybe it has to do a couple conversions at the back end, and you might have to do some at the front end. But grams to moles and moles to grams is very commonly here. <clears throat> so really, those four steps are the four basic steps that you should always follow when you do a stoichiometry problem. So let's talk about how we can kind of do the stoichiometry part of it. So if we take an equation such as this one here, which is balanced, from this one balanced equation, we could come up with a number of relationships, and they are all based off of the coefficients. So they're all just simply based off the coefficients. There's no calculation to figure out the relationships. It's frankly just a number. So when I look at this equation, I could say that there are two moles of CO. For every two moles of CO I put in there, I need to put one mole of O2 in with it. I could also say that for I get two moles of CO2 out. I could also say for every one mole, so no coefficient means one, right? So for every one of O2, I get two moles of CO2 out. So these are all what are re referred to sometimes as being stoichiometrically equivalent to each other. That's a fancy way of saying a, an equivalence uh, sort of statement. They are definitely not equal to each other in terms of numbers. So clearly two does not equal one, but they're equal to each other in terms of proportion of what you need to kind of dump into this reaction to make it go. So again, like if you're making cookies, you got to put so much flour, so much chocolate chips to get the dozen cookies out, right? So this is sort of the proportion at which you need to throw it in there to get this reaction to happen. Because technically they are equalities for any equality, like we talked about way back in chapter two or one, whatever chapter that was, you could actually write two conversion factors for each of these equalities that you have here. So for example, the very first one there, uh, we could say, for every two moles of CO, I could have over one mole of O2, or I could use it the opposite way, one mole of O2 over two moles of CO. For the second one, I could say for every two moles of CO over two moles of CO2, or I could flip it around, two moles of CO2 over two moles of CO. And lastly, for the last equality, one mole of O2 gives me two moles of CO2 or two moles of CO2 give me one mole of O2. So from this one balanced equation, we have three equalities and six different conversion factors that we could use to solve a problem. You would not use all six of them. You obviously would choose only the one that you need to complete the problem. Um, and obviously you would leave the rest alone. You wouldn't use them. First off, any question on how I got any of those there? So for example, if we look at one here and we go through sort of the four steps that we talked about a second ago on doing a stoichiometry problem. So let's just say we'll use this equation here. 
And let's just say that we started with We'll do uh, 25 grams of CO2, and we want to know how many grams of O2 would we produce. So this is a basic stoichiometry problem. They basically give us one piece of information about somebody, in this case CO2, but we actually want to know about O2. So to start these problems, you really would start with the four steps that was sort of outlined there. Again, you can kind of skip the first step on the last one. The very first step is to make sure you have a balanced equation, which obviously we do here. The next step is to take whatever they gave us and we want to convert to moles. So in this particular case, they gave us 25 grams, 25 grams of CO2, do I need to convert that into moles? I do because they're in grams. So to convert the grams to moles, we would ask to calculate the molar mass of CO2. So we would have to go to the periodic table and we go to periodic table and CO2 is 12.01 uh, for the carbon plus uh, 32 grams for the oxygen, 16 each gives us 4401 grams per mole would be our molar mass of CO2. So the second step we're going to do is really just a conversion between grams to moles. And the reason we're doing this is to get it into the right units. So if we do this here, we want to go opposite, right? So grams are on top. We want to put the grams on the bottom here, 4401 grams per mole of CO2. Grams cancel, and in my made up one here, we end up with 25 divided by 4401. We'll get us uh, something like 0 0.56805. I'm not going to round too much here because we got more to go on the calculation. Any questions on that? So, that is really your first two steps in pretty much every stoichiometry problem balance equation, convert to moles. Now what comes next is actually the stoichiometry part of the calculation. The third step is to go to the equation and find the mole to mole relationship. Now the mole to mole relationship we're looking for is this, in this particular problem, but ultimately we want to end up with what thing in the equation? We want to end up with the the grams of O2, right? So this is really what the stoichiometry part is. We need a way, right now we're sitting at CO2. So we need a way to go from CO2 to oxygen. And again, you can't find it. So we're going to use the equation basically as our conversion factor. So we're going to find the relationship between those two. We wrote it earlier from the coefficients for every one mole of O2, you get two moles of CO2. And from that relationship from the equation, it gave us really these two conversion factors that we could use that would be applicable here. Right? So in this case, we want to get rid of CO2 and we want to end up with O2, right? So if we continue my calculation here, I would take my number I just got, which was 0. 0.56805 moles of CO2. Remember opposites cancel. So which one of those conversion factors, this one or that one, should I use the one on the right or the one on the left to do this? Yeah, we want to use the one here on the left. That's going to get rid of CO2, which is what we're not interested in and allow us to convert over to O2, which is what we are interested in. And that is like the big stoichiometry move right there. So that is what stoichiometry is. It's just that conversion factor. So we're going to do two moles of CO2 on the bottom, one mole of O2 up on top. The moles of CO2 will cancel. And that's really our third step there. And if we get a number at this point, uh, we're basically just going to divide this by two. We'll get us 0.28403 moles of O2. 
And again, this relationship came from the balanced equation. So that's where we got those relationship from. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> if I wanted the answer in moles, right? I would be done. I just put a box on it, maybe clean up some sig figs, right? But in this case, we don't want moles. We do want grams, which is a very common ending here. So the fourth step is to take the moles of where you are at and convert it to whatever unit you're looking for. So in this particular case, we are looking for grams. That means we need the molar mass. What molar mass do I need at this point? The molar mass of what? I do need the molar mass of O2 because at this point we are no longer CO2, right? We did the stoichiometry and we're at O2. So we need to go back to the periodic table, get our molar mass of O2, which would be two times 16, right? Which would give us 32 grams per mole. And we could do our very final step here, which is moles on the bottom of O2. So they cancel. Uh, 32 grams up on top of O2. Moles will cancel times in it here by 32. Gets us about 4.5 grams of O2. And that would obviously be step number four. So pretty much every stoichiometry problem that is a basic stoichiometry problem, regardless of how scary the equation looks, the numbers look, is these four steps. Balance the equation, convert to moles, mole to mole relationship, and then convert those moles to whatever unit you're looking for. If you do all those steps in order, bless you, you will end up with the right answer. Yeah. If something is done for you, don't undo it. So if you're starting in moles, don't unconvert it and reconvert it. I've seen it done. It is kind of fun to watch, but you shouldn't do that. Um, you just go on to the next step. So if something's done for you, you just proceed to the next step. What these numbers basically say is if I want to produce 25 grams of CO2 in this reaction, I would need to dump in there about 4.5 grams of O2 to do that. So that's how many grams of O2 I would need to produce that 25 grams of CO2 that we got. Any questions on any of those steps? Now, I personally broke it up into each step and I got an answer after each step of the move there. If you do that, I'm okay with that. Um, but do not round until the end, yeah? So again, here, probably our final answer should be based off of that number right there, the original number, which was three. Um, you could absolutely do all these steps back to back. So you could go from here to here to here and just do it all in one calculation. It's all good as well. So, you know, however you want to do it, I'm okay with it. Um, but if you want to do it all together, you can. If you do it individually, just again, avoid that rounding until the end. Any questions on any of that there? All right. Well, I feel like I did one, so you should do one. There we go. All right. So this what's scrolling by is what we just talked about. So let's do this one here. And let's actually just do um, let's just do the first question of it, and then we'll do the second one after that. So just answer this question basically: how many moles of H2? Uh, would you get uh, starting with uh, 5.32 moles of lithium? In this case, we do not have the equation given to us. So this is what I was talking about earlier. If you have it in words, you want to make sure you just get the proper formulas down. So lithium metal is just Li, right? And water is H2O, I hope still. Yeah. Hydrogen gas is h Two. So remember, hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, those are diatomic. And water is obviously not water. Lithium hydroxide would be LiOH. All right. You start from that point. Follow those four steps. It is clearly not balanced. So you might want to do that first. So I'll rewrite those four steps for you. Balance the equation. Convert to moles. Mole to mole relationship and moles to some other unit. All right, so take a couple minutes. Not, so hopefully you balance it by, uh, I'm just going to keep putting twos and hope for the best. I think that's the right number of twos there. Uh, so we got two lithiums, uh, four hydrogens on each side, and two oxygens. So that should be the balance equation. Once again, I can't emphasize enough that if it is not balanced, you're just wasting your time. Yeah, so it's got to be balanced for sure. 
All right, so that takes care of the first step that we want to do. Then the next thing we want to do is pretty much take whatever they gave us, which in this case is they gave us uh, 5.32 moles of lithium, and we want to convert it into moles. Do I need to do it in this case? I don't because it's already in moles, so we just good to go. The next thing we're going to do is really the stoichiometry part. So this is where we go to that balance equation, and we want to find the two things we're interested in. One thing we're interested in is obviously uh, what they gave us, which in this case is lithium. The other thing that we're interested in is what we're trying to find, which is H2 in the end. So those are the two things we really want to focus in on. Again, from that, we could get the stoichiometric relationship, which again is just the coefficients. So that's going to be two moles of lithium gives us basically one mole of hydrogen. Once again, from that, you could have two conversion factors. You don't necessarily need to write them out, but I'll just write them out one more time here to show one mole of hydrogen, or you could use one mole of hydrogen over two moles of lithium. So in this case, since we have lithium and we want to get the hydrogen, uh, we should definitely use this one here. That's the one that's going to allow us to do that. So that would be our next step, which is really the stoichiometry part of the calculation. We're going to take two moles of lithium and one mole of hydrogen, which comes from the balance equation. That takes care of the moles of lithium, allows us to go from lithium now to hydrogen. And essentially, we're just going to divide it by two there. Uh, so 2.66 moles of hydrogen. Any questions on that there? <laughs> Now, in this particular case, we are looking for moles, which means, technically speaking, that is our answer. Yeah, so that would be our answer. If I did want grams, what would I have to do next? I would need the molar mass of H2 at this point to do that. And if you did that and didn't obviously ask for it in this question, that would be 2.016 grams of H2 from the periodic table per mole of H2. And that would tell us that in this particular case, we would have 5.36 grams of H2. So if we wanted it in grams, we would do that extra step. In this case, we didn't need to do the extra step. Uh, we actually were done at this step. Any questions on that there? Now, by the way, because H2 is a product, this is also sometimes referred to as the theoretical yield. So the theoretical yield is the amount of product you should make based off of your calculation and your balanced equation. This would be the theoretical yield in moles. This would obviously be the theoretical yield in grams. Yeah. And that basically is, in theory, how much you should get out if you did this experiment. So if you did this reaction, everything went perfect. That is how much H2 you should produce. Question on that there. Why we have this one here, just to illustrate, as we were talking about earlier. Now, let's just say we were actually interested in uh, how much lithium hydroxide we would have produced. We could do the same thing. Again, the relationship works kind of similar. And we could actually start, if we wanted to, from the amount of hydrogen that we produced. We could take the 2.66 moles of H2. We then could go to the equation and now do the relationship between these two, which from the equation is one mole of H2 gives us two moles of lithium hydroxide. We could use that as our conversion factor, putting the moles of H2 on the bottom, the two moles of lithium hydroxide up on top would produce 5.32 moles of lithium hydroxide. So again, this illustrates the point that you could do it between two products if you want, you could do it between two reactants, it's still the same four steps, works the same way. Obviously, if we wanted to know how many grams that would be, we would use the molar mass of lithium hydroxide and convert that into grams as well. So again, you could do relationships between anybody in the equation. It's just the same four steps that you follow. Any questions on any of that there? That obviously would be the theoretical yield for lithium hydroxide. 
You can only have a yield for products. So products are only the things yielded in a reaction. Reactions cannot be a yield. So if you calculate some type of reactant vol thing, uh, mass, it uh, cannot be a yield. Only products could be yields. So any question on that? All right, then let us you tackle there then the second half of the question there. So I'll just get rid of all that. And then this one here, we're going to go and do the second one. So we just did this one. All right, so let's do this one here, which is how many grams of H2 can you form by reacting 81.75 grams of lithium with water? We're going to give you some numbers. It'll be helpful for the periodic table. Lithium, 6.941. Uh, hydrogen, 1.008. And oxygen, 16. All right, obviously using the same equation that we had previously in this one as well. So we'll rewrite that up there for you. All right, so go after it. We balanced it already, so that's good. Again, follow the four steps and see what you come up with here. Uh, previously, we already did number one there, so we got the same balanced equation. In this case, only one piece of information given to us, which was 81.75 grams of lithium. My second step is to convert it to moles, which in this case, obviously I do need to do. So we would go to the periodic table and we see that the molar mass here of lithium is 6.941 grams per mole. We're going to use that as our conversion factor to convert from grams to moles. That means the grams needs to go on the bottom. The moles need to come up here on top. The grams will cancel. Now, at this point, if I wanted to get an answer, I could, or I could continue on with the calculation. So I'm just going to continue on with the calculation to show you, obviously, what that would look like. Again, if you got an answer at this point, I would not round too much, you know, take it to a few digits and stuff like that. At this point, we are sitting right now with moles of lithium. So we go to our third step, which is now to do really the stoichiometry part. So just like previously, we're going to look for the thing that they gave us, which was lithium. We're going to look for what we are interested in. And that's the same relationship as we had on the previous problem, which is two moles of lithium gives us one mole of H2. We're essentially going to use that as a conversion factor. So moles of lithium are up on top. So to get rid of lithium, they need to go opposite. So we would put the two moles of lithium on the bottom and the one mole of hydrogen up on top. That is the stoichiometry part, and that is what's going to move us from lithium now to hydrogen. So that would be our third step. Any questions up to there? Once again, you could get an answer at this point, probably don't round. If we wanted moles, that would be the answer, and we would be done. But once again here, we're still in moles. We do need to get to grams, which is what we're looking for. So. We do need to do step number four, and that is going to require some molar mass of H2. Once again, we're no longer with lithium here. We are at H2, so we need the molar mass of that guy, which obviously is two times 1.008. I get you 2.016 grams per mole. In this case, we want the moles of H2 to cancel. So up on bottom is our moles of H2. And up on top is 2.016 grams of H2. The moles will cancel. And now we will do our math, which is basically multiplying everything that's on top. So that's 81.75 uh, times 2.016, hit equals. Come back and divide by what's on the bottom, 6.941, hit equals, and divided by two. That's us 11.87 grams of H2 in this particular case, which once again would be our theoretical yield in grams. So again, what this number represents is if we put in there 81.75 grams of lithium, everything went perfect, no side reactions. You didn't drop anything along the way. You didn't leave any of stuff in the beaker. Uh, you should technically get out 11.87 grams of hydrogen as a result of this reaction occurring. Any question on any of those steps? Now, a reminder, uh, when we do molar mass, 
like we did in step number two, step number four. When you do the molar mass, it is based on just the formula, not the number in front. So molar mass is how many grams per one mole. Always should be calculated from just the formula. <coughs> Excuse me. As we talked about, you would not want to use the two there because we used the two with the stoichiometry part. So if you use the two with the molar mass and the stoichiometry part, your number is going to be wrong. So whenever you calculate molar mass, sometimes people see the two in front of that and go, oh, I need to like multiply the molar mass by two because there's a two. You don't do that. Again, molar mass just simply from the formula. Whatever the actual formula is, is what you get it from. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay. Then let's take a look at another one here, I think. This is what we just did. In case you want to rewatch it and put yourself to sleep later. That was it. All right, it's here somewhere. There it is. All right. So uh, using this equation here, if we started with 765 grams of C6H12O6, uh, what is the mass of CO2 that's produced? And the mass here would be in grams of CO2. I'm gonna give you some numbers here. Carbon is uh, 12.01. Whoops, 01. Uh, hydrogen 1.008. Okay, let's take a look and see. So again, obviously it's a stoichiometry problem. So uh, we definitely just want to follow our four steps. So we're going to start with our balanced equation. And that looks like we are good there. I see some numbers. It looks balanced, I hope. Uh, step number two, again, we're going to take whatever they gave us and whatever unit it is in and basically convert it into moles. So again, uh, maybe more than one conversion you may have to do in certain problems. But in this case, we do need to do that. We have uh, 765 grams of C6H12O6. So again, to convert that into uh, moles, uh, we need the molar mass of this guy. So we got uh, six times 12.01 for our carbons, uh, plus 12 times 1.008 for our hydrogens and plus six times 16 uh, for our oxygens. That's going to give us 180.2, I believe, grams per mole. And that is C6H12O6. So we're going to use that uh, as a conversion factor here. So step number two here, taking our grams, putting the grams on the bottom so that they cancel per mole of our C6H12O6, the grams here cancel. Any questions up to there? Once again, you could get an answer at this point or you could continue on with the calculation, whichever way you prefer. Um, at this point, we uh, would then do uh, step number three here, which is really the stoichiometry step, which is the mole to mole relationship. So once again, we're going to go to the equation find the two things we're interested in. So one thing is always what they gave you. The other thing you're interested in is what you are trying to find in this case. So again, we want really the mole to mole relationship between those two guys there. And from the equation, it is simply just the coefficients. So it tells us for every one mole of our C6H12O6, we get out six moles of CO2. So we're going to use that as a conversion factor. So continuing on with the calculation here, our moles of the C6H12O6 is on top. So to get rid of it, we do need to put it in the opposite location on the bottom here. Up on top would go the six moles of CO2. That would be our third step and really our stoichiometry step that comes from the balanced equation. 
the moles of this guy are going to cancel. And again, if we stopped right at this point, we are in moles of CO2, which could be our answer if we wanted moles, but in this case, it is not. We actually want grams. Uh, so we do need to go one more step here. Over CO2. So when we get the molar mass, we need the molar mass of CO2 at this point. Uh, so CO2's molar mass, I think we did a little bit earlier, 12.01 grams per mole, uh, plus two times 16 grams per mole gives us uh, 4401 grams per mole. We're going to use that as our final step here, which is step number four, uh, which basically is take those moles. For. In this case, we do want the grams up on top, so we end with grams, and we want the moles of CO2 on the bottom so that they do cancel. And at this point here, uh, 765 times 6 times 44.01 divided by 180.2 would be a better number. We end up with 1121 grams of CO2 which sig fig wise should probably come back to this number, which has how many sig figs? Three, which means perhaps this guy maybe should be 1120 grams of CO2 would be a good sig fig ending to the story here, I guess. Hopefully you could see a pattern that it is frankly those same four steps, yes, over and over again will get you to the end, yeah? Any questions on any of those stuff, yeah? Yeah, I would say so, because most of the time in this case, uh, you got in most of the calculations, some molar mass, which is sort of like an exact number, um, and you got probably a multiple relationship, which is like a whole number, so kind of like a counting type of thing. So I would say in most of these cases, you're probably correct if you go off of that very first number that was given to you, uh, would be the correct number of sig figs. Since again, in terms of math wise, we're pretty much just multiplying and dividing basically throughout the whole thing, which means we would look at sig figs. Other questions? Once again here, since CO2 is a product, uh, this technically would be our theoretical yield. And once again, basically what that means is if we threw 765 grams into this reaction, everything went perfect. It never does, but if everything went perfect, you should get out about 1120 grams of CO2 with a little sig fig roundiness there. Any questions on that there? Any questions on basic stoichiometry problems? Yeah. So again, pretty much just follow those steps and you should be good. All right, so let's then talk about something else here. Maybe that's the rest of this problem. Hopefully they agree with what we got, I hope. That's good, all right. <laughs> it would be bad if they didn't agree. Let's skip this one, I think, and we're going to go on to this. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, sort of the idea of uh, limiting reagents. Uh, they're also sometimes referred to as limiting reactants. Um, the idea here is this, that when a reaction does take place, uh, typically speaking, there's usually a reactant that sort of gets used up first. And there's usually a reactant that you have sort of plenty of. Um, and that is basically what is referred to as a limiting reagent. So in a reaction, there's usually some type of reactant that gets used up first. And that is what is known as the limiting reagent. And again, sometimes people call it reactant. And there's usually a reactant that you have plenty of. And you usually have some of this guy left over at the end of the reaction. That is what is known as the excess reagent. So for example, today's experiment, number 15, you're gonna weigh out like 0.4 to 0.6 grams of potassium iodide. Then you're gonna dump like 25 milliliters of lead to nitrate on it. 
The potassium iodide is the smaller amount. It gets used up first as the limiting reagent. The uh, lead, to, uh, lead to nitrate is the excess reagent. You have plenty left over because you take like 50 milliliters of it and only use 25. So you have definitely plenty of it left over. Why is limiting reagents, limiting reactants and those things really important? If we just take a basic sort of example. If we take a reaction of A plus B makes A and B. Now let's just say, for example, that A here is our limiting reagent. That means at some point along the way, as A and B are reacting, we're going to use up all of our A that we have. The result of that is, is there any way at that point, once A is used up, is there any way to make any more products? There's really no way to make any more product because you need obviously an A and a B to come together to make the product. So the importance of the reagent is, it is always the one that determines how much product you make. So it is always the limiting reagent that determines how much product you make. So kind of like uh, they used to sell, I think they still do like hot dogs and hot dog buns. They gave like eight hot dog buns and like 10 hot dogs. Never the right, never noticed that. Take a look next time. That's the, the one you used to. Maybe they changed, but over the years, that's eight hot dog buns. Hot dogs always in the package. You always run out you need to buy some more buns. Then you need to buy more hot dogs. It's a vicious cycle, right? You, you go all the way through. So clearly in that case, obviously, if you want to make sort of whole units of hot dogs and hot dog buns, uh, at some point, you're going to run out of buns and you won't be able to do that. And obviously, that would be your limiting reagent. You could also, in these type of things, as we will talk about, you could do calculations to figure out how much of your excess reagent is left over at the end of the reaction. Um, but the point of the limiting reagent is it's really important to identify which one is the limiting reagent because that's really the one that you need to use when you do your calculation to figure out how much product that you make. How do you know if it is a limiting reagent problem? There's a pretty simple way to figure out, you know, is this a limiting reagent problem? And it is this, if you are given enough information about the reactants that you can get to moles for each reactant, then it is a limiting reagent problem. So if they give you information about both reactants and that information is enough for you to get to moles of both reactants, it is 100% a limiting reagent problem, and you need to figure out at some point along the way which one is the limiting reagent. Now, if you think about the examples we've done up until this point, we pretty much have only been given like one piece of information, right? One reactant information. Um, we also will give one product information. So in cases where we sort of did previously and we were given information about the reactant, but only one piece of information about one reactant, uh, it is assumed that that reactant is the limiting reagent, which is why we use it to calculate how much product we made. But definitely, if you're ever given enough information about the reactants that you could get the moles, that should be like the trigger in your head, hey, it's a limiting reagent problem. How do we solve limiting reagent problems? Well, frankly, there's, I won't say thousands, there's multiple ways you could do it. And we will talk about it next time how to properly solve them. Um, but that definitely is something, you know, if you come across it is a limiting reagent situation, you will have to at some point figure it out. The good news, the rest of the problem is pretty much the same. It's very similar to how we do regular stoichiometry problems, but you have to take that additional step to figure out the limiting reagent uh, sort of uh, before you can 